Thank you very much. That was a great sermon. Good to be here. If you have your Bibles, maybe you can open up to Romans chapter 8. I was in Rome a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago with my wife Jesse and another couple, which is very interesting to go to Rome. Beautiful, uh, old city, architecture, and of course, Vatican City, where you definitely have to go. Not uh, uh, in any, not any value for Christianity, but historically very, very nice to see. But one of the things that was very interesting is that they have the holy door, which um, was recently reopened by the Pope in the beginning of the year. And they say, if you go through that holy door, you, you'll have the grace of God upon you. Somehow you enter into the presence of God and you have the grace of God upon you. And in the beginning of the year or at the end of last year, the Pope went through it. And then the former Pope who was in pension, he also went through it and a lot of people went. And even in the Netherlands, several churches, Roman Catholic churches, they had this open door. And people could go through the open door. And for Roman Catholic people, that is very, very important. And I believe the reason why this is so important is because many people always have the desire to start again or to open up again, or to begin a new life again. And this is also very, very important for us to see. Because many Christians, they can wrestle with the attitude of defeat. Like you don't go anywhere, maybe the new year you have new hopes, and then uh, the third week those hopes are gone. They say, I tried this, I tried that. And so the desire in us is always that we can start all over again. I want to preach about the spirit of victory. And the Bible says in 1 John 4, verse 4, you don't have to look it up. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And we need to believe that. I want to take a look first at the defeat mentality in Romans chapter 8. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. But some verses, and of course you can read it for yourself in the afternoon if you like to. First one, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Skip to verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. To those who are the called according to His purpose. 31, what then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? And then for 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Tremendous portion of scripture. One of the things it's talking about, it's talking about people that are in the flesh. And of course we know uh, people that are sinners, people who do not know Jesus Christ, they are in the flesh. 
But it also has to do with us sometimes because Christians can be in the flesh. It can be sinful attitudes. It also can be like a, a, a flesh, a carnal attitude that you become carnal in your thinking. Depressed, negative, without faith. And you become carnal and those are the people that are in the flesh. Now many times we think about, you know, worldly people. Or we're talking about people that are from the world and they have all kinds of problems. But you know, we can have the same problems, but we have Christ. And that many times is the difference. I read an article about a man in the Netherlands. He's very famous, a professor, small house. He's an uh, anesthetist or anesthetologian. I don't know how you call it in the English, but uh, he puts people to sleep because before, you, be, before they cut you open. And he's a very famous doctor in the Netherlands. And also he writes columns in the newspaper. And he talked about uh, going uh, into pension in the Netherlands at 67, you have to go on a pension. But a lot of people don't want to go on a pension. And he said, all my knowledge and everything that I lived for, they are taking it away from me. And he called it a traumatic experience in his life. And he even said that he became suicidal. Because all the purposes in his life, it looked like everything was taken away from him. And that is what happens sometimes to people who live in the flesh. Because there are circumstances in life, they come your way and you have nowhere to go. And you cannot get a hold of Christ because you either do not believe in him or you're too much focused on circumstances. When I read it, it reminded me of a lawyer in the Netherlands and it was a famous, uh, important uh, statement that this man made. It was a famous lawyer. And he was uh, very well paid. And he said, I always look down on people. Because everybody who came to me, it was people with problems. And I never had any problems. Then he got a stroke. And he became lame from one side. And uh, could not walk anymore. And his life fell down. And he made a, a statement which I... I thought it was very interesting. He said, life conquered me, which means he felt defeated and he never built it up. See, if you are in the flesh and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you become carnally minded. You come to places where you lose hope. There's no hope. There's a story about Hannah Laura Cole. She was the uh, wife of the former Bonds Kanzler Helmut Kohl. He was the prime minister from Germany. He was a rising star, but his wife had a bad history. After the war, the Russians came into Germany, allied forces from the other side. And many times Russian soldiers would rape German girls. And so what happened, Hannelore Kohl was raped uh, by several men. And then they threw her out of the window and they left her for dead. She survived it and life went on. She married Helmut Kohl. Helmut Kohl became a rising star in politics. But Hannah Laura could never get over the past. And she picked up diseases probably linked to her spiritual life because she was very defeated. And she got an eye disease. She could not live in the light. She had to actually live in the darkness. So she would wander around in the parks of Berlin, totally in the middle of the night, because she could never be in the sunlight. She lived behind curtains. And while Helmut, her husband, was rising up in politics, he became famous. He was on television. Everybody liked him. She was there all by herself in the darkness. She could never get over it and finally committed suicide. A very, very sad story if you read about it. But this is what happens many times in life, that people go through crisis and they cannot get a handle on it and they cannot overcome it and they see no solution. We know that in the Bible sometimes, there's a man called Ahitophel, and he was a famous man, and everybody would listen to his advice. He used to be the former advisor of King David, and then he uh, ran with uh, Absalom, and there was a time that they did not want to follow his advice, and the Bible says that when his advice was not followed, 
He put his household in order and hanged himself and died because he saw no more purpose in life and didn't want to live any longer. We know about Judas. That the Bible says, seeing that he had, that Jesus had been condemned, he hanged himself and he ended his life. In the Netherlands and also, I believe, in other places, we are always confronted with news about people who commit suicide. I read about one girl and she wrote and she put it on Facebook before she killed herself. She said, I see no other option. I'm not a good person and I see no other option than only to kill myself. See, this is many times where people end up if they do not know God. And if you don't have God, sometimes this looks like this is the only solution. But you know, this is not only true for uh, sinners. This is also true for Christians that are in the flesh. I don't know if that's the generation, but we have a lot of people in our churches. They're always reacting in emotions. It's all about feelings. It's all about emotions. All they look at is the circumstances of life. And if you are carnally minded, you can end up in a place where you see no hope. See, the only reason why we have hope is because we can always involve God in our lives. And that is the thing that gives us hope. If you lose that, even if you're a Christian, but if you lose that, you end up in a situation where you have the feeling that there is no hope. Even in the Bible, you can read about Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. He comes to a place where he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life for I'm not better than my father's. See, I know he was a great man of God. He was a great prophet, but he started to look at circumstances in his life. And he allowed emotions to come up. And this is what happens to you when you're in the flesh. People in the flesh, they have no hope because they're not focused on God. Because they're only focused on the circumstances of life. Now, if we go back to our text, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ if Christ lives in us. Now, the confusing thing is sometimes we still wrestle with the flesh. And the Bible says the carnal mind cannot please God. That is sometimes confusing. And sometimes people, they're always, they have this uh, condemnation upon them. One commentator said it's the old sinful nature that determines their lives. In another translation, it's talking about a sinful thinking or a carnal thinking. And what I believe is important for us to understand is that this is especially a mentality. It's like an attitude. You're either spiritually in your thinking or you become carnal in your thinking. You can still be a Christian, still go to church, still come to conference. We can still stand and preach behind the pulpit, but you can be spiritually thinking or you can be a carnal thinking uh, person. That means that in everything uh, you surrender to emotions, you surrender to feelings, or you surrender to the flesh. And when you do that, it starts to dominate your life. I read an article recently about a man. He uh, was a man that had his own house and uh, he felt very sorry for a woman that he got to know somehow. It was a homeless woman with kids. So he moved back to his parents' house so that this lady could live in his house for a couple of weeks. But the problem is she never wanted to leave. And here he is, he's 50 plus, and he's living back in his parents' house because he allowed a woman with children that he didn't really know to live in his house. And she became a dominating factor in his life. This is what happened to Judas. He was a selfish man. He was focused on money. It's in the Bible that he was focused on money and it's important for us to understand. And he never dealt with it. And it became a, an, an overruling, it became a dominating factor in his life unless he could no longer control it. 
And the Bible says when this woman broke the alabaster box in order to bring the anointing upon Jesus' feet, and there was something that happened in the life of Judas. And the Bible spoke about the devil who came in him. He couldn't be released anymore. He was defeated and finally hung himself. Sometimes we need to think about this. What is the dominating factor in your life? Sometimes there are things that you allow in your life and you say, well, uh, I'll handle it, I'll deal with it later, but you know, it doesn't want to leave anymore. And it becomes a dominating factor in your life. And that's what happened to this man. He allowed his woman and the children to live in his house and he had to leave out of his house, lost all the authority and it became a dominating factor. When we're thinking about dominating factors, it can be a sinful life, but it can also be an attitude, a way of thinking. And it is amazing many times how many Christians in the circumstances of life, they're not thinking spiritually. They see no hope. They don't involve God. All they see is darkness. All they see is hopelessness. Uh, they talk negative. Uh, they speak. That's the way it is. It's a whole attitude. And that attitude cannot please God. And I believe those are the carnal thinkers. Those are the people that are in the flesh. Now, I'm not saying that you're a sinner, but you are in the flesh because fleshly thinking or carnal thinking dominates your spiritual life and it knocks you down. I want to take a look secondly at the power of the resurrection of Christ in verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. One commentator says the fact that Jesus resurrected from the death gives the guarantee for us as believers that we will be resurrected. Amen. But there is the power of the resurrection. It means there is um, uh, overcoming death. It's a victory over death for all believers, which means we have eternal life and should focus on that. It talks about victory over spiritual death because we are born again but it also talks about victory over bondage and slavery we are delivered can you say amen and we can be set free and there's a tremendous truth in it we had Christmas Christmas is very important in the Netherlands people eat and they go out and they have a lot of family time but in the midst of that, we have all these pastors now in the Netherlands who openly confess atheism. They come to conclusions that they no longer believe the Bible. They no longer believe in God. They no longer believe in Jesus. They continue to preach because the Bible still is a good book, but they don't believe in it anymore. And many Christians, many people in the Netherlands, they have that idea. They are Christians, but Christmas has nothing for them. And there's no truth what they believe. You know, Jesus lived among us, but what was more, he died for us and he rose from the dead so that we can have that spirit of resurrection power. And many people don't have the, any clue, no idea about that power. When Jesus died at the cross, he made a statement and he cried out, the Bible says, it is finished. And that was very powerful because by his stripes we can be healed. And by his death we can have forgiveness of sin. And through his resurrection, amen, we can have the victory. Christians don't have to live a defeated life. Now I'm not saying, you know, you have all these wrong doctrines that... Christians don't have to be sick and Christians only have to die at an old age. That's stupidity. I'm not talking about that. But you don't have to be defeated. Which means that, you know, when you get sick, we believe in healing. But even if you don't get healed, Christ is still on the throne. And you can still serve him. It was William Booth at the end of his life, he became blind. And he said, I served God with my eyes. I can also serve him without my eyes. Amen. Sickness doesn't have to become the dominating factor in our lives. All kinds of problems where we go through, 
They don't have to become dominating factors in our lives because Christ is still on the throne and we shouldn't focus on problems. We should focus on Jesus Christ. And then there is always hope. And this is very powerful. We will never be without sin. Amen. We have our shortcomings. We have our sins. We have our mistakes. Sometimes we fail, but we don't have to be bound. Because we are set free, we are justified and sanctified through Jesus Christ. That should give us a whole different mentality, a whole different lifestyle, and a whole different view on life. We came in a different state, our status, no matter how you call it. Colossians 1 verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood and forgiveness of sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. This is a tremendous spiritual impact when you become born again. You're taken from one kingdom and put into another kingdom. Out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That is a total different status that we have. We are sanctified. We are cleansed. It means we are set apart for God and we are justified. Literally, we are reckoned unguilty. And then there's more. Paul says in Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Different aspects. He says that I may know him. What Pastor Foley talked about. I mean, to know how God feels about sin, about life, to know how God thinks, amen. That is so important. He says, this is what I want. I want to get to know him, and I want to get to know the power of his resurrection, which means that we can live in victory. We're not meant to live in defeat. Like this lawyer who said, life conquered me, or life has defeated me. It's just because of one problem. And he came to a point, I no longer want to live. It's just like Elijah, when he focused so much on the circumstances and on what people said, he said, I don't want to live any longer, I just want to quit. That's wrong. That's not meant to be. And then it's talking about the fellowship of his suffering. It means that you and I, we have to crucify the flesh from time to time. Can you say amen? And we have to continue to crucify the flesh as long as it is necessary. And when we do that, he says, conformed to his death, we die to the flesh. And then we come to the resurrection of the dead. Because in Christ Jesus, we have eternal life. Over the years, uh, the church in the Zwolle becomes a little bit older. The people get older. And when you get older, you have sometimes more problems or different problems. The body doesn't want to go as fast as you used to. And there are all kinds of little things and all kinds of problems. And many times I have no answer. Uh, you know, sometimes there's only one thing that you can say. We need to believe God for a miracle. And that is the only answer. You can go deep and say, oh man, what a deep trouble you're in. But there is always hope if you continue to focus on Jesus Christ. No matter what happens, no matter what crisis you go through, no matter what other people go through, that, that should be our focus, that there is always hope if you believe in Jesus Christ. Because in him we are more than conquerors, and that means we don't have to have that defeated life. There are sometimes problems that come our way. Ecclesiastic says, time and chance happen to all of us. Time, that's when you look in the mirror and you have more wrinkles and pimples. That's time. <laughs> but chance, chance, that's the, um, it's the, I would say those are the things that happen to you and you never expected it. 
There are times that we thought we would all be healthy, waiting till Jesus Christ would come back. My father had that. He always said, I know I will be there when Jesus comes back, but he died in that faith. And so we grow older, we see people die, we see people become sick, sometimes they don't restore. And so the problem is that sometimes people, they get a, you know, fear grips their heart and they start to think about the future. And they say, oh, what's, what's going on? What should I do? I talked with an insurance company some time ago about our pension. I said, in our, in our fellowship, we have no pension. We believe we continue to preach behind the pulpit. And when we're dead, we lay the pulpit down, sleep in it, and cover it with sand. <laughs> and he said, that is, uh, that is kind of crazy. That's red alert. Yeah, it is. We don't know. But, you know, we have to keep our eyes on the future and our focus on Jesus Christ. And we be conformed to his death Amen. We die to the flesh so that we will have eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. That we will have eternal life in Jesus Christ when we die. I want to close with a final thought. And that's the spirit of resurrection and victory. If we go back to our text in uh, Romans chapter 8. Two important things. There's a difference, he says, between living in the spirit and living according to the flesh. It can have to do with people that live in sin and people that live a holy life. But it also has to do with people they live in a carnal thinking. And the difference between them who live in a spiritual thinking. It's your attitude, it's your mindset, it's your mentality, it's a way of life. And it's a difference between victory and defeat. Because if you live by emotions, if you live by feelings, you will lead a defeated life. That's a fact. Because sooner or later, there will be circumstances that knock you out. You have to live according to the spirit. Then it's also talking about there is no condemnation in verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Amen. That's very, very powerful. In the Netherlands, we have the Dutch Reformed mindset a lot. It has to do with predestination. Uh, many times, a lot of people in the Netherlands, they always feel this... Um, uh, accusation, that spirit of accusation, self-condemnation. Here it is, we, are, we have no condemnation if you live according to the Spirit. And then in verse 1, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who shall be against us? In other words, you don't have to live by fear. You can live in faith. And whatever circumstance you face, you still can live by faith and not by fear. In verse 11, it says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Then in verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Then in verse 14, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. It is the spirit of resurrection and it is the spirit of victory. Now, you can apply this in two ways. If you're talking about the spirit of resurrection, it's the spirit of Jesus Christ because he died for us and he resurrected. Amen. And that's why we can have victory. But there's also a spirit that can dwell in us. And you can either, either have that spirit of the carnal mind or you have that spirit of resurrection. Amen. And live in resurrection power. Pastor Mitchell sometimes quotes that in Crusades, there's resurrection power. And in that power, there is salvation, there is deliverance, and there is healing in that resurrection power. 
Amen. But you and I, we need to uh, actually adopt that spirit so that you and I, we start to have that spirit as a second nature. That it becomes an attitude. It becomes something that has to change in our lives. That there is a different way of thinking for the coming year. Maybe you look back last year and you've been defeated in certain areas. You've been defeated in most areas. Maybe you've been defeated and have not seen revival. What are you going to do? Say, oh, well, that's how it is, and, you know, life is hard and rough, blah, blah. Or you say, no, I'm going to believe that there's another chance, and there's a new way, and I can have revival, and I can have a breakthrough, and God is possible to do a miracle, and you do not give up. We always learned that quitters never win, and winners never quit. It's so simple as it is. It's not more difficult. Amen. You just have to continue to believe in God and believe the Bible and believe what God can do because in him we can be more than conquerors. The Bible says what Jesus did, we can do greater things even. And that's very important for us to see in our minds that there are lots of things that we can see happening. You can see all the problems. You can look at all the uh, downfalls, but you can also see God is able to do something great. Zechariah 4 for 6, and I close with that portion of scripture. Then he answered and spoke to me, saying, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not by your strength, it's not by your power, amen, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord. It is God who builds the house. It's God who builds your marriage. He can do miracles. It is God who builds the house. If we're talking about pioneering or building the house of God, you have to involve God. Sometimes it's so difficult to say, am I doing something wrong? Yes, maybe. We're always doing something wrong. But sometimes, sometimes we don't know and you try to do everything that is good and it's not happening. But you don't have to lose heart. You keep the faith and say, it is by the Spirit of God. I just involve God in my life and I start to focus on what is possible and I start to focus on the future with God and you never know what God can do. The Bible says, in Him we can do all things. David says, with my God, I jump over a wall. And we can do that. That's the God we serve. He can do great things in our lives, but it all has to do with your spirit. It should be a spirit of resurrection instead of a spirit of defeat. It should be a spirit of hope instead of hopelessness. And you continue to focus on Jesus Christ. There was a lady in South Africa uh, who later became a writer. And she wrote a book and an interesting title. It is uh, The Grave Rejoices. I bought the book, never read it. Somebody borrowed it, never got it back. <laughs> One day I got it back. I want to read it. But... The book is about this woman, and she had two children, and one child died when he was about nine years old, I believe, in a car accident, and she said, I went through a crisis because I, I could not understand why God would allow me to go through this. She lost her son, and so she tries to restore. Then another son goes out, serving on the beach, goes into the water, never comes back. And I believe they thought he was eaten by a shark. And she says her life went really down. She really became, you know, at a point that you almost lose your faith in God. Somehow she met Christians and got saved again or got really saved into a relationship with God. And that's how she wrote the book. She says, every time with Easter, I go to the beach and I go to that very place where my son was lost in the water and we start to sing and praise and worship God. And that's why she said, the, gr the grave rejoices. I thought that's a good attitude. That in the midst of all your problems, you continue to praise and worship God. Because he enthrones on our praises. We don't have to have a spirit of defeat. We can have victory and resurrection power. Amen. That's all I have. Let's praise and worship God.